with Mr. Ray Kelly, the longest serving commissioner of the NYPD in the history. So Mr. Kelly, thank you, first of all, for joining us and agreeing to do this interview. We appreciate it very much. And I also wanted to thank our founders, Chaim Chesler and Sandra Khan, and our chairman, Matthew Bronson, and our dear president, Aaron Frankel. Uh, also, dear audience, if you have any questions already, Mr. Kelly, please do not hesitate and just write them to us in the chat. We will be very happy to provide you to the opportunity to receive an answer uh, after the main interview concludes. And uh, so this is actually my great pleasure to introduce you to our host, a dear friend of the FSU and a member of our board, and the president of the JCS International, Michal Groyevsky. Michal. So welcome and shalom. <clears throat> During these past few months of coronavirus lockdown, the Mood FSU, an organization that uh, behold the highest value and gifts education around the world, and it's very dear to my heart, has been offering online learning opportunities on a variety of uh, captivating topics. We have had the honor of hosting and learning from many leaders from Israel and the United States on a variety of issues. And today we have the honor of uh, spending a precious hour with the most accomplished and respected police commissioner in the nation around the world. <laughs> the legendary Mr. Raymond Kelly. I'm proud to call him a personal friend and an esteemed colleague that has been a special advisor for Ambassador Ronald S. Slaughter for the past few years. Commissioner Kelly will be interviewed by Matthew Bronfman, chair of the Limud FSU International Steering Committee and one of the organization veterans and most dedicated supporters. Matthew Bronfman wears many fantastic hats. Matthew, the Jewish philanthropy, is no, n needs no uh, introduction, certainly not to the Limud FSU audience. He has supported Limud FSU since its inception and has personally attended and spoken to audience and consulates Limud FSU conference across the globe. Matthew Bronfman, the businessman, is one of the largest Jewish American investor in Israeli economy as the main shareholder of Ikea Israel, Israel Discount Bank, and the Supercell supermarket chain is also the chairman and CEO BHB Holding. And of course, Matthew, the dedicated family man and a real dear friend. Today, we have the pleasure of meeting to Matthew Bronfman, the interviewer. And I would now like to turn the microphone over to Matthew for him uh, leading the in, uh, introduction and discussion with Commissioner Kelly. The audience, as Natasha said, is invited to ask questions through the Zoom chat question and answer tab. And we will try our best to give time for as many of your questions to Commissioner Kelly as possible. Matthew, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Michal. Thank you for that very lovely and gracious introduction. Uh, Mr. Kelly, thank you for being here in the audience. Great to see you all today and for spending an hour with us. With 50 years in public service, including 14 as police commissioner of New York, Ray Kelly is one of the most well-known and highly esteemed leaders in law enforcement globally. He served as police commissioner from 1992 to 1994 under Mayor David Dinkins, and in 2002, Mayor Michael Bloomberg again appointed Mr. Kelly as commissioner. He served until 2013, making him the longest serving commissioner and the first to hold the position for a second separate term. Mr. Kelly created the first counterterrorism bureau of any municipal police department in the country. He also established a new global intelligence program stationing New York City detectives in multiple foreign cities. In addition to dedicating extensive resources to preventing another terrorist attack, 
the NYPD under Kelly drove down violent crime by more than 40%. Commissioner Kelly also innovated the department's technology, including the creation of the Real-Time Crime Center, a state-of-the-art facility using data mining to investigate leads. Kelly also served as commissioner of the U.S. Customs Service, for which she was awarded the Alexander Hamilton Medal for Exceptional Service. In the Clinton administration, he served as undersecretary for enforcement at the U.S. Treasury Department, where he supervised the U.S. Customs Service, the U.S. Secret Service, the, the Bureau of Tobacco, Alcohol and Firearms, and the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. In addition, Ray Kelly was vice president of Interpol from 1996 to 2000. In 1994, President Clinton appointed him as the director of the International Police Monitors in Haiti, where he established an interim police force earning Kelly the exceptional meritorious service commendation of the President of the United States. And if that were not enough, he is a Vietnam combat veteran and retired reserve U.S. Marine Corps Colonel, an attorney with an LLM from NYU, a graduate of Harvard's Kennedy School with an MPA, recipient of the Legion d'Honneur from French President Nicolas Sarkozy, and has been awarded 12 honorary degrees. With that, Commissioner Kelly, welcome. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to also greet, greet you and, and acknowledge that you're spending an hour with us today. And we're very, very grateful. And our first question, if you don't mind, sir, is what was your reaction to the video that we all saw of George Floyd's death? And is this typical police behavior? Do you think there is endemic racism among police around the country? And what is your view of the protests that were sparked by Floyd's death and how the police handled them? First, let me thank you, uh, Matthew, for that kind introduction. I want to thank McCall as well for those kind words. My reaction to the video of George Floyd's murder uh, was one of shock. Now, I've been around a long time, and I've seen several videos, of course, of, of police brutality. But usually what you see in those cases is a rash act, somebody making a decision that they regret. What struck me with the George Floyd killing was the deliberate studied nature of the actions of this police officer. Here you have witnesses looking at him. You have someone taking his video. You have people telling him, get off. You have George Floyd saying 27 times, I can't breathe. And yet this police officer chose not to move. What he said to George Floyd was, hey, you're using up oxygen if you, if you talk. So don't mm -hmm. talk. So eight minutes and 46 seconds. It is the worst incident of police brutality uh, that I've seen. I can understand the outrage. Uh, I can tell you based on my long experience, that this type of action and the other uh, ones that I, that I made reference to are clearly aberrations. This is not what police officers do, but I can understand the public saying, hey, wait a second, here's a camera right in front of this individual, yet he chose to continue to, in essence, murder this yeah. man. Why, don't, why shouldn't we believe that it's, it's happening all the time? I'm here to say it isn't, it doesn't, but I can understand the concerns that, uh, that it raised. Now, as you said, I was in Vietnam. I came back and I policed the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam demonstrations. I have not seen crowds the size of what we saw in the George Floyd demonstrations since Vietnam. These were huge mm -hmm. crowds and it showed the level of concern that, that, that people have uh, for this event and police brutality in general. So do you think there's endemic racism among the police? I don't. I don't think it's endemic racism or systemic racism, as a lot of people say. There are individuals who can be racist, just as there are in any profession. But I think there's been an awful lot of training, an awful lot of change in the decades since I've been, uh, since I started in policing. But that is a concern that uh, a lot of people have. The surveys have been done that show that Police officers become police officers because generally they want to do good. They want to help mm -hmm. people. And I can tell you countless of incidents that I've seen where officers literally risk their lives for people of all colors and, and creeds. So I don't think there's systemic racism. I think we have to do a much better job 
of weeding out the people who are racist and do a much better job in general of selecting uh, more effectively people who are meant for policing and eliminating people who are not meant for the, for the business of policing. What do you think about the movement uh, that it seems to be getting a lot of traction with politicians, particularly to defund the police? I mean, how can we maintain low crime rates in big cities and at the same time, you know, uh, take huge budgets out of the police departments? And, like what they're yeah, trying they, to do in, in it, Minneapolis. It, the, the funding um, movement makes no sense at all. It is just lashing out somehow, trying to punish the, uh, the police. It's sort of a mindless reduction. And in Minnesota, or Minneapolis, they're going to eliminate the, uh, the police right. department. You know, this hurts only the poorest people in our society because they're the ones who need the police. They're the ones who want the police the most. They may not love the police, but they know they need uh, the police. That's where police resources generally wind up going. So it makes no sense. Here in New York City, uh, Mayor de Blasio sort of made a symbolic move of defunding the police. He, he uh, canceled the hiring of a police cadet class coming in. That's going to have no real consequence, but it's important uh, symbolically. Uh, so the funding throughout the country, I think, can mean, can, can take a, a greater uh, effect or a greater reduction uh, in, in certain cities, and it may, it may really hurt there. It's not going to really hurt in, in New York City, but uh, it doesn't hurt the police officers individually. If you reduce the size of the police force, it means that the indiv individual officers oftentimes earn overtime, and they like <laughs> overtime. So it's a mindless reaction that, uh, that I see no benefit to. Can you address for, for a moment that what seems to be a, a pretty precipitous rise in gun violence in New York City over the last month? And, and is it a reaction? Is it about, is it having to adjust the reaction to George Floyd? Is it because there are less police on the streets? Um, what, what do you attribute it to? Well, there's no question that the police are backing off. They're backing off from uh, proactive uh, activities. Now here right. in New York City, one of the most effective crime fighting tools is the anti-crime units. They are a group of officers in plain clothes. They ride in taxi cabs and other uh, vehicles that don't look like uh, police vehicles. Uh, they've been very effective two decades. The mayor eliminated those units. So I see a direct relationship between the elimination of those units and skyrocketing uh, shootings. Shootings have gone up over 100%. This week, for instance, right now, as we speak, they've gone up over 100% of the similar week uh, last year. And I think it's a result of the police just simply backing off. I mean, they're not dumb. They're being told not to engage. If you remember, Mayor de Blasio said, hey, uh, do it with a, a light hand. Well, you know, they're not, they're not dumb. Every police officer is wearing a camera. They're just not engaging in the way they, they used to engage. And quite frankly, I don't see a lot at the end of the tunnel right now. I don't see us getting out of this uh, anytime soon. Uh, I see the shooting records. I see what happened last night. And, you know, the weekends are particularly dangerous. And you see it, of course, in other cities. You see it in Chicago. You see it in in Minneapolis, you see it in major cities throughout the country. The police are, are stepping back, and this primarily is the reason why shootings have uh, increased all over the country. So, so in 2014, of course, we had the Ferguson uh, killing. Um, ha have things changed since then, and, uh, and what still needs to change? And since you mentioned uh, the police officers are wearing cameras, what's your view of uh, cameras on cops? Well, Ferguson uh, in 2014 uh, was a case I think we should look at uh, quickly. And Michael Brown was this uh, individual who robbed a store for, of cigars and an alarm was put out over the radio. A police mm -hmm. officer from Ferguson stopped Michael Brown walking in the street with cigars. Michael Brown reached into the police car and grabbed the police officer and also grabbed his gun. He, he ran away from the car, the officer got out, he ran towards the officer again, and he was shot. Now, what happened was the police chief of Ferguson never put any narrative out as to what happened. 
So they allowed Michael Brown's body to stay in the street for four hours, which is incredibly stupid. What happened is the crowd developed and uh, riots took place for several days after that. What should have happened is Michael Brown's body should have been moved. Now, a federal examination was done and it exonerated the, the police officer. This is four months after the shooting. Michael Brown's DNA was found on the officer's gun and on his, his collar. So by not getting a story, a narrative out quickly, the riots developed. People oftentimes forget that the police officer was exonerated uh, mm -hmm. in, in the Ferguson uh, matter. When you say what has changed, I, I, I'm not certain that much, much has changed. The police backed off after Ferguson. That kind of uh, light uh, approach has remained uh, since Ferguson. It's only been exacerbated with the murder of, of uh, wow. George Floyd. Uh, as far as cameras are concerned, uh, look, the train has left the station as far as cameras. Police yeah. are going to have to wear cameras. What cameras do is they make police officers hesitate to slow down. Now, in some people's minds, that's a good thing. In some people's minds, it's a bad thing. The reality is that it is here. And police officers have to realize that, that they're wearing it, that their, their acts are being recorded. I think by and large, they do. And they act much more cautiously as a result of, of wearing a camera. So uh, it, it's here to stay. Uh, I was initially against them. Then I, I changed my mind because I thought they would show some, some good things, a lot of good things that, that cops do. And, and overall, overall, they do. But we have to factor in the hesitation that police officers uh, exhibit when they arrive in the scene of uh, an incident uh, because of the fact that they're wearing a camera. Uh, my, my guess is like most news, o only the incidents where cops unfortunately don't behave perfectly uh, make the news. The thousands of incidents where they actually, you know, are behaving exactly as they should and compassionately, et cetera, that doesn't make the news. It's, it's, it's not right. going to make the New York Post headlines. Okay. Cops, Good news well. is not news. <laughs> it's not news. Um, yeah. And since Limud FSU uh, is really an organization that deals with Russian-speaking Jews throughout the world, um, are, there, are there things that communities of faith can do to, to bridge the gap and the divide between communities and, and police officers? Well, I would hope so, but I can tell you that there's a lot of interaction between uh, clergy and the police, certainly in the busiest areas of, of most major cities. They have the police clergy coalition. So there's a lot of communication, but uh, and unfortunately I have not seen it make a big difference. I used to go to black churches well, many, many times on many Sundays and speak to the, to the congregation. They're good people, they're law abiding people, but uh, they don't have um, an easy way to control the criminal elements in, in some of these uh, communities. But it's important to continue to talk. It's important to have communication you can go to clergy when there is a problem in the community to help sort of quell a disturbance, which I've done on, on many occasions. So I think we have to keep trying through, through that, uh, that vehicle of police-clergy relations. But uh, so far, it hasn't been uh, extremely effective in, in, in holding down uh, disturbances or crime in some of our busiest neighborhoods. Thanks. If we're going to pivot a little bit to uh, uh, an issue that is near and dear to our audience's heart, which is anti-Semitism. And you've been studying anti-Semitism, not only in the U.S., but in Europe and beyond for many, many years. Do you have any particular observations and conclusions? And do you have a sense of, of why we're seeing this rise uh, of anti-Semitism now and what possibly could be done about it? Well, and let me tell you how I got involved in it. Uh, Ronald Lauder, president of the World Jewish Congress, McCall had mentioned uh, someone who's devoted his adult life to fighting anti-Semitism. I knew Mr. Lauder through my many years in, uh, in policing in New York. And of course, he's a very high profile person in, in New York City, former ambassador to uh, Austria. He asked me to take a look at anti-Semitism in Europe. This is a little bit before we saw the, the uptick in anti-Semitism. Here, he wanted to have a snapshot. He wanted to know 
what's going on with some granularity in various countries in Europe uh, as far as the Jewish community was concerned. So I put together a team. Uh, that team consisted of myself, David Cohn, a 35-year veteran of the CIA and worked for me for 12 years in the NYPD. Uh, Mitchell Silver uh, was head of our intelligence analysis in the NYPD. David Cohn was in charge of intelligence. Mitch Silver in charge of intelligence analysis, a very bright uh, young man. And uh, the three of us did a lot of research into the issue of anti-Semitism. And then we went to Europe to get some really detailed uh, information. Our methodology right. was to meet with government people, to meet with former uh, prime ministers, to meet with uh, uh, imams. To, we actually wore kippahs on the street in Paris to judge the, uh, the reaction. And mm -hmm. we put together a very uh, detailed report. We, we visited 11 countries, 10 plus one, I'll explain that. But <clears throat> so w this report has been turned over to Mr. Laura. Now he understands and I understand that taking a report and making it of this nature, making it public in Europe will only have people see red. Who are three Americans coming over here and telling us, you know, what, what the problems are. So right. through Mr. Lauder's contacts, many contacts, he's taking these findings and he's moving incrementally on a personal sort of one-to-one -one basis to see if he can make some change in this age-old problem. I can tell you a little bit of our findings. Uh, be great. First major finding is that governments in Europe simply are not doing enough to protect the Jewish uh, community. No, not enough resources are, are being spent. And secondly, the Jewish community itself does not have the resources, does not have the structure to uh, protect uh, uh, themselves. They just mm -hmm. can't do it uh, on their own. And the sources of of anti-Semitism is nothing new. It, it comes from the right, the neo-Nazi, the emergence of the, the neo-Nazis. They've never gone away. But I think as the, the move, the populist move in Europe has given them sort of cover to flex their, their muscles. Then you have the left, you have the BDS movement, uh, which, is, which is strong some on, on the university campuses in Europe, as well as here. And then you have the sort of the threat in the middle, which is from the increasing uh, Muslim community in Europe. In France, for instance, you have more Muslims in France than any other place in Europe. And you have more Jews, 450,000 in France, um, the Jewish population. So it's like oil and water. And one of the problems in France is this secular form of government, where they, in essence, at least fiction is that they don't, recognize religion, so not enough resources go into protecting the, the, the Jewish world in France. And particularly what I would say, we, we kind of decided there were three stratas. There's a wealthy Jewish community, there's a middle-class Jewish community, and there's a, then there's a working-class Jewish community that are often commingled with, with Muslims in some of the uh, suburbs of Paris. That's where we see the most risk to uh, the, the people in, um, in, in France. So they, we, as I said, we have very specific findings and specific recommendations. We, uh, we visited uh, Belgium, Ukraine, Germany, France, the UK, um, Hungary, Austria, uh, Sweden, uh, Poland. We did a report on, on Turkey and uh, uh, that, that, that's it, that, those are the 11 countries. Uh, but I, I think it's of concern, it should be of concern. And of course, we saw the uptick here in, in, in our country. More difficult to identify uh, anti-Semitic groups here. In, in Europe, they're, they're much more visible. They're much higher on the skyline. But here, it's kind of amorphous groups. They're, they're caliphate, if you will, is the internet. That's where they hang out. And it's okay. just, um, it's more difficult for law enforcement to identify them here than in Europe. Very, very interesting, thank you. Um, when, you were, when you were commissioner here, both under uh, Mayor Tinkins and Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, 
Uh, how did you deal with hate crimes and anti-Semitism? Well, I think New York City, uh, the police department, and even before my time, we had a, a very strong relationship with the Jewish community. We have a hate crimes task force in New York that's very, very active. We had um, virtually every synagogue in, uh, yeah. in uh, New York is covered by police, some form of police presence on Shabbos. So there is, there is a, a, I think, a major awareness and sensitivity to the threat of anti-Semitism in New York. What you see, too, is this kind of ongoing assault of, uh, of people who are visibly Jewish, Hasidim, uh, for the most part. They uh, are victimized on a fairly uh, steady basis, and it's cause for concern. Uh, certainly put police in those communities. Uh, if you go now to the, the Lubavitch headquarters, you'll see police vehicles right in front of that, uh, that location. So New York, I think, has a pretty good record of being aware and, and paying attention to the threat of, of anti-Semitism, but it, 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 it's always there. Uh, there's this the tension that exists in certain uh, of the poorer communities where you'll have Hasidic or Orthodox uh, uh, communities. So I also am very involved with 92nd Street Y. I was president, I was chairman, and we have one of your finest, uh, Kevin Green, who runs security for us there. And, uh, Good man. He yep. gives us a huge amount of comfort. He's really, yep. a, really a star. Um, do you think, since you've worked for, for Mr. Lauder and, and studied things in Europe, do you think that the acts of anti-Semitism are different here than they are there? I'm sorry, different in, in Europe? In the United States versus, versus uh, Europe, yeah. As I said, I think they are much more blatant in, uh, in Europe. By the way, uh, hate speech is against the law in, uh, in France, yet you can have anti-Semitic uh, statements on shirts. So nobody's Nobody's uh, arrested for it in, in right. Europe. They're just kind of allowed to go free with the rationale that, oh, if we arrest that person, they put them in jail, they'll only become more hard and then they come back as a, as a threat. So it's this kind of laissez-faire uh, attitude. Here, I think there are, uh, you know, there, there, there is some sophisticated ways of monitoring some of the um, anti-Semitic uh, actions and this the is very much engaged in that. A lot of the threats come uh, through the internet. And uh, mm -hmm. we know that there's only about 20% of the internet that's registered. The, the rest is the deep web or the dark web. That is where a lot of anti-Semitic uh, movement is fermenting. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we saw the horrific uh, shooting, the murders, at the, the Tree of Life um, you know, Pittsburgh, yeah. synagogue in as October 27th of 2018. And that that place, unfortunately, was open, was an inviting, was inviting this individual walk right in with an AR-15. Uh, and six months to the day, we had the Poway attack, the Poway Lubavitch uh, synagogue, where the same thing happened. Individual walked in with a rifle. He had 50 rounds of ammunition, his gun jammed, and he, uh, and he ran out. We have to be alert. I think a Jewish community has to be much more vigilant, much more aware of who's coming into their facilities, who uh, you need uh, security. You need, uh, at, the, at the very least, you need that double door approach that you'll see in many synagogues in Europe. You just don't let people walk in. We had five principles in our report that, that I think should be followed. Vigilance. Individual Jews and members of congregations have to be aware of their surroundings. And if, they're, if they are uh, if they're attacked uh, in any way, shape, or form, they've got to report it. We've got to know what's, uh, what's going on. You need volunteers. Generally speaking, the, the congregations don't have enough volunteers to help protect themselves. People have other things to do, I understand it. But you'll see more volunteerism in Europe at synagogues than you see uh, here. Technology has come way down in price. Uh, you need cameras, you need alarms. So look at what happened in, in Hall in Germany. They, they reinforced their door 
by the way, I think it was thanks to the Jewish agency. That saved many, many lives. There were 75 sure. people in that synagogue. So technology bolstering the, uh, you know, fortifications that uh, you have training, you have to train the congregations, they have to know, you need uh, tabletop exercises, they have to know what to do in case there's, uh, there's an attack, and they need partnership. Partnerships with the local police, you gotta reach out, have them help in designing a plan. There's five things that we talk about, vigilance, volunteers, technology, training, and, and partnerships. It, it, you cannot have an open environment, in my judgment, at, at Jewish institution at, at this point in history. Uh, first of all, it sounds like an incredibly thoughtful, laid out uh, set of criteria, set of things that, that need to be done. It's a little bit of a sad commentary on the world, that uh, place of faith, uh, and again, this we're talking specifically about Jewish, but it could be any, you know, church, synagogue, mosque that, that people need to think about security. Uh, but it, but we are where we are in the world, and uh, I think your recommendations sound uh, incredibly thoughtful and detailed. Um, what about the BDS movement? Um, and do you think the BDS movement, uh, which as you mentioned, you know, primarily on college campuses, is that is that affecting the rise of anti-Semitism? And is anti-Zionism also uh, increased? Is that, how does anti-Zionism, BDS, and anti-Semitism all play together? Well, uh, and, as you know, as we all know, it starts off as anti-Zionism, but very quickly becomes anti-Semitic. -anti and if you go to some of these college campuses, uh, you can see it, obviously. And, and like, there's an org organization with several, several chapters, probably 200 chapters, students with, justice in Palestine. And they are often the motivators behind the scenes for the BDS movement on, on campus. And BDS is particularly strong in, in my view, after having mm -hmm. researched it at, uh, in this area, Columbia, uh, NYU and, and Rutgers. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is there. It is feeding anti-Semitism in my opinion. Is it growing? It's hard to say. It seems to me that it's that it's sort of reached a reached a plateau, but it's uh, it's there. And as I say, uh, SPJ is very very active, active on a lot of campuses. Mm -hmm. And one of their major items is the BDS movement. Yes, I mean I'm I'm uh, honorary chair of the Hillel at NYU, uh, and and involved in, 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 in uh, Hillel globally as well. So we, we definitely see it. And as you mentioned earlier, anti-Semitism is not just a neo-Nazi thing. It's also coming from, from the left, uh, which is a scary thing. Yeah. Um, switching, uh, if you don't mind for a moment before, my sort of my last question before we send it to our audience, uh, you know, COVID has had truly unimaginable consequences, uh, including on the New York City budget, and I'm not sure that New York City actually understands how devastated the budget is going to be. I've heard, you know, numbers down from $90 billion to $80 billion. And I've heard other people say it could be down to $50 billion in terms of revenue. Um, and a city that's paralyzed by the virus, what's going to be the impact on keeping New York as the safest big city in America with, with these kind of budget cuts and the political movement that we addressed a few minutes ago? Well, I'm very concerned about the future of New York City. I was born in, in Manhattan. I've, I've lived in New York City all my life and uh, I'm gonna die in Manhattan or New York City. But uh, I, I think we have not come to grips with the major impact that this virus is gonna have on the city. Now, the budget process, as you mentioned, it has not taken into recognition the projected $9 billion hole that's in, in the budget. What you have is the mayor and the city council not recognizing it at all, not making necessary cuts. They're gonna wait till they get, it, get down to the 11th hour. They're gonna hope that Washington gives them sufficient money. And this is when he painted a Black Lives Matter sign right in front of the, you know, the president's residence. Uh, good luck with that. And then you superimpose on the impact of the virus, this crime wave that uh, we've seen. And quite frankly, I'm very concerned 
far as the NYPD is concerned, the, the, the looting that went on which should not have been, should not have happened, let's put it that way. It should have been, should have been ways to, to prevent that. But this stays in people's mind. Here we are, we're talking on Zoom. The Zoom economy is taking hold. People are comfortable being out of their places of, uh, of business. And maybe people will come back. Maybe it'll be piecemeal, that sort of thing. It has to have an impact. Hopefully, you know, only in the short term, but has to have an impact on real estate, both commercial and residential in New York, which has been the, the lifeblood of, of so many things, so many good things that have happened in New York. So I'm concerned about it. I think the, I don't unfortunately see uh, changes taking place that's going to reverse the, the crime trend, certainly not for the next uh, 18 months. And I think the, the virus is going to have such an impact on businesses. We don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to look a lot different when we come out on the other side of this than, uh, than it did uh, before. And I think we all have to be concerned and, and work together to help bring uh, what I think is the, you know, the capital of the world, New York City, back to someplace close to where it was. Thank you. So I, I'll take one second to establish my New York bona fides. I was also born uh, in Manhattan, as was my mother and her mother and her father and uncle. As a matter of fact, my grandmother's uncle was the first Jewish governor, Governor Herbert Lehman uh, of the state of New York. Uh, so we've got a long line of uh, New Yorkers in our family, and it is the number one city in the world, the capital of the world, and I too am very, very concerned about the future of New York. You've got better credentials than me. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, only from lineage, not from, not from duty. I'll put it that way. Um, and if it's okay now, Natasha, I think it'd be great if we could open up to some of the audience questions. I'm sure everybody's got questions for Commissioner Kelly. Yes, yes, we have a lot of questions for Mr. Kelly. The first question is from Yaron Shalom, and he's asking, my family and I ventured out yesterday for the first time in a long time, and the feeling of security that I had for the past two decades just vanished. A lot of stores are boarded up, graffiti was everywhere, and no police presence was obvious anywhere. Uh, do we have gone past the tipping point in your opinion, or are we close to it? And what can we still do to mitigate the situation? Well, it's an important question and not one that's easily answered because this is not the first time I've heard this. People don't feel the same in New York City as they uh, now, as they did before, uh, before the virus. Um, we need, a police presence. We have a big police department, 36,000 police officers. Uh, they have to be directed and encouraged to be more proactive. But you have a mayor that is telling them to stand down. They keep uh, talking about de-escalation, de-escalation. If you look at the newspapers, if you look at the newspaper today, you can see police officers involved in a fist fight and not doing very well because people are now more willing to challenge the police than any time before. And you saw that during the protest where the demonstrators went right up to the police, put a camera six inches away from, away from their face and were taunting them, were goading them. So I'm concerned. I wish I had an answer. I'm not in government. I think we need a change of administration and that will unfortunately have to wait for 18 months before mm -hmm. this this mayor is out, and uh, I can only hope that uh, there's someone better uh, coming along, because we're in a dangerous place in the history of New York City, and uh, it, 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 we need a champion to come in somehow and, and, and straighten us out. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Robert Cantor. Uh, in your many years as an industry thought leader in policing, have you ever been more concerned about skyrocketing crime due to the reduction in funding? Well, I am. Uh, I, I'm concerned about uh, the crime going up. And uh, as I say, I don't see 
anything in the offing to slow it down because the removal of the anti-crime units, this is a little bit of inside baseball, I understand that, but to me, having been in the business a long time, the anti-crime units, civilian clothes police, who target certain locations, maybe target certain individuals who have a long record, they have been extremely effective in reducing violent crime. They have been eliminated. Mm. I mean, what, what I haven't seen, as far as I know, is any delegation going to the mayor, business delegation, saying, how can you do this? You know, you're, you're destroying or attempting to destroy the greatest city in, in the world. And crime will do that. Uh, you have people leaving because of the virus, and you'll have people leaving because of crime. So wake up the Blasio. But that hasn't happened, to the best of my knowledge. They are uh, skittish about uh, approaching. So I wish I had a better answer. I'm pessimistic, certainly in the short term, about the future of New York City. And when you walk out, I understand that you just don't feel as safe and secure as you did uh, six months ago. Thank you. And we have another question by our founder, Mr. Heim Chesler. Heim. I'd like to ask a sensitive question, although it's a apolitical question. You know, everybody in the Western world look upon America, the great nation, the great democracy. And the way the United States handled the virus, it look, doesn't look so well. I mean, you are now have a great company together with Brazil and India and South Africa and Russia, but not able to deal the matter. Even let's take New York. The governor say one thing, the mayor say another thing, the vice president say third thing, the president say fourth thing. It's like, look like a mess. But it's not just in New York, it's like in the entire nation. There's no unified policy how to tackle. And uh, do you can okay, give us an analysis what needs to be done in order to overcome this uh, situation? Please. Well, I noticed you didn't mention China when you mentioned the country. I think, I, I think it, it, it's pretty well recognized that China is where the virus started and they covered it up. They didn't let the rest of the world know of the dangers of uh, the coronavirus. So we're paying the price for that. Now you can argue as to effectiveness. Unfortunately, it's become a real political issue here. It's a, you know, Re Republicans, the president didn't do enough uh, you know, I mean, the Democrats are, are attacking the, the uh, Trump. Trump administration didn't do enough. Trump is saying he did enough and blaming China. And the Democrats want to keep the economy shut down. I know it looks confusing, but it looks it's confusing throughout the world. Nobody seems to have a, a an answer uh, as far as this is concerned. And uh, We'll have to wait and see. We're only uh, about 110 days away from an election. So we'll see what, uh, what if the change happens, we'll see what, what that brings about. But you can't leave China out of the mix. It's clear that they, they did not put out timely and sufficient information as to the threat from the, from the virus. And the whole world has, has paid a price. And probably, relatively speaking, China has <laughs> gained significantly in, in relation to the rest of the world in a whole host of areas because of the, because of the virus. So uh, there's no easy answer. Uh, I would like to see everybody wear a mask. I think that uh, would be 90% of, uh, of the problem. But even you just saw for the first time, President Trump wore a mask yesterday for the first time. You would like to have him wear a mask virtually all the time as a, uh, as a message to the, to the country, but we don't have that. Thank you, Mr. Kellen. We have another question from Michael Helmitsky, and he's asking how important it is to make police officer certification mandatory, and will it improve the situation in your opinion? Certification, is that the question? Yes, police officer certification. Uh, well, well, it, it, I don't think it's needed in New York City and other major cities, but there is a movement and it was in the Democratic, it was in the House bill on police reformation to have a certification entity in each state 
so that the police departments meet certain, uh, certain criteria. Probably a good idea because there are 18,000 police entities, law enforcement entities in the United States. That's an incredible number. And in theory, there's no uniformity. De facto, there is some. But in theory, each of the states and departments can go their own way. So I think certification is a noble goal. Um, I, I, I'm not certain it's going to happen. As you may know, there is no uh, coming together on a police reformation bill in Washington. The Democrats voted unanimously for their bill. Uh, the Republicans controlling the Senate didn't accept it. And the Democrats in the Senate rejected the Republican proposal for, um, for reforms. You need 60 votes in the Senate to get a bill to the floor. They didn't have 60 votes because of the Democrats. So you have this gridlock that's going on in Washington. It's certainly going to continue until election day. So you'll see no legislation happen between now and the end of the year. But certification, uh, I think, is, is a, a noble goal and something that should be considered um, throughout America. Thank you. We have a question from Ansel Browner, and they're asking, you're saying that monitoring in France, uh, like Belgium and the UK, is not enough. It requires enforcement on hate speech, at least in the streets. Uh, whether or not, in your opinion, law enforcement can get into the deep web? Well, there, are, there is monitoring going on in uh, of the deep web. There are some firms that do this. Uh, Yes, there are uh, national organizations that do it, but it's not easy. It's not easy. It's uh, just by definition, it is huge. And there's all sorts of barriers and codes to it. But if your question is, is there some monitoring going on? Monitoring is probably too strong a word. Is there, too, is there some penetration going on in the deep web and the dark web? The answer is yes but it is a major, major challenge because that's where uh, an awful lot of bad things uh, develop. And uh, we, we don't, law enforcement does not have a handle on it. They have some information, but certainly not, uh, not I would say, in a significant way. Okay, we have another question by Matthew. Uh, Commissioner, you know, you, we've now talked about some legislation in Washington or the lack that will happen. We've talked about defunding police and we've talked about the increase in violent crime. Do you think there's any hope to get some gun legislation uh, through Congress at any point? Maybe not obviously in this presidency or this term, uh, but uh, starting with, with the next, whether Trump's reelected or, or presumptive Democratic nominee Biden gets elected. Do you think there's any way, uh, I mean, we need to, in my view, I mean, we need to take guns off the streets, particularly if uh, police around the country are being asked to uh, calm it down a little bit. Uh, do you think there's any hope of that whatsoever? I think there is some hope, but only in the area of the gun show loophole. By that I mean, um, and I had this when I was in the federal government, very much, uh, involved in this. Uh, you and I, uh, private citizens, we can, under federal law, we can sell each other guns without using a background check. And a lot of that happens at gun shows. You go and we had one individual had 800 guns and he said he was a private seller. So what the gun show loophole does is allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Legislation might come forward that requires a background check for any exchange of, of weapons, any purchasing of weapons among private citizens. At one time, now this is somewhat dated information, at one time about 40% of guns that were confiscated were believed to come through that, that what we call the gun show loophole. There's some indication on both sides of the aisle that there's, there's increased uh, receptiveness that that type of legislation. Is that a game changer? Probably not. Is it a good thing to have? Yes, it is a good thing to have. 
but there's, we're in a, we live in a country that now has more guns than people. It's estimated yeah. that there are 330 million guns in the United States. I mean, that's an incredible number. And it shows you what police uh, confront. If you're doing a car stop or going into a home or domestic violence, the chances of a gun being in present is tremendous with that, with that number. So we have a major national problem with, with guns. The gun show loophole, it's a good thing to do. Uh, as I say, I, I don't think it's going to change our world much, but that's the only legislation that I see having any chance. Mm -hmm. We actually have a follow-up question regarding guns. Uh, from Alex, he's asking, you are familiar with different police forces around the world, of course. Uh, do we think it's easier to serve in the police force in countries where the NRA is weaker or is not existent than the American? Uh, I, I don't think the NRA is a factor uh, one way or the other as far as being, being easier to police or not. I think what's, what's important to realize that the United States it is we have a polyglot. We have so many different ethnic groups and cultures uh, in this country that we have to deal with. We don't have a homogeneous population like many other, uh, other countries have, which are generally easier to, to deal with. So we, we have this great diversity in this country coupled with 330 million guns. <laughs> it makes for a very challenging um, uh, day for <laughs> police uh, throughout, uh, throughout America. Uh, you know, we tried to make the NYPD, and we did make it the most diverse police force in America. On my watch, on Mayor Bloomberg's watch, we brought police officers into the NYPD born in 106 countries. No other police department in the world can come anywhere close to that. So it's the most diverse police department in the world, and arguably the most diverse city in the world. So, you know, diversity is a, is a, a good thing, I think, in, in policing, but it, it doesn't answer all <laughs> challenges by, by any means. New York and, and the United States in general is a very difficult and challenging place to, uh, to police. Yes, and we have another question. What can Bill de Bellagio learn from the methods of action of Giuliani, which during his serving as a city mayor, the crime ratio in New York dropped drastically? Well, you know, to say de Blasio and Giuliani in the same sentence, uh, it just <laughs> makes, no, makes no sense. I mean, I, uh, there's nothing that Bill de Blasio would ever say he would learn from Rudy Giuliani. He came in, he, he ran against the police in 2013. He bashed the police, a whole stop, question, and frisk. His son, you know, being, being stopped on the street. It, it, that is so different than what Rudy Giuliani did. Rudy Giuliani did a great job. He, he cleaned up the city. He was proactive. He didn't listen to all these different groups complaining about uh, what the police should or shouldn't do. He did, a, he did a, an amazing job. De Blasio has been 180 degrees different. He has sapped the strength of the police department. Retirements are at all-time highs. Cops are voting with their feet. They're going out the, out the door. Uh, that certainly didn't happen in the Giuliani watch. So the, the, de Blasio would accept nothing from, a, uh, from um, uh, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> it's just they're oil and water. Thank you. So. We have another question also related to the mayor of New York. How important is for the NYPD and especially the mayor to cooperate with the Jewish community leaders and the Jewish community itself in order to understand the problems and the ways to keep the target of the Jewish populations back? I think it's extremely important. And I like to think I did that uh, a lot when I was the commissioner. You know, I was also in charge of Crown Heights when I was in in the uniform command. I met the Rebbe, you know, Rabbi Schneerson on, on many occasions. We had an awful lot of communication, awful lot of, of interaction. And to the extent it's not going on today, and I'm not certain if it is or it isn't, but if it's not going on today, it's something that should, uh, should change. 
we need that communication. The police department has to do a very effective job in protecting the obvious Jewish communities, the, the uh, Borough Park, uh, Williamsburg, uh, Crown Heights. Uh, they, they are treasures for the city and they have to be protected. And uh, I, right now, these days, I still communicate with the, with the Lubavitch in, the, in a, a Crown Heights. So yes, I would hope it's still going on, but I can't state with any certainty because I'm not in government. Okay, so we have another question from Michal. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Kelly, I want a final question to ask you. Maybe you could consider run to be the mayor of this city. No. <laughs> Save us all this headache. Yeah, thank you. Thank You're you, McCall. That? It's very nice, but uh, no, I think I'm uh, too far gone, too far down the road here. But uh, we need someone. We need we need to change a direction here, or this city is going to continue on a downward slope. The greatest city in the world. We've got to change, and uh, we've got to change in significant, important ways, not just around the edges. We have to change our approach to law enforcement or you know, Bill de Blasio, you know, will be the reason why New York uh, falls from its uh, it, it being the number one, the number one city in the, in the world. Uh, I'm very worried about it. And uh, hopefully we can coalesce a, a, a movement to at least bring about change uh, 18 months from now. Mm -hmm. We have also the final comment from our audience, uh, from Robert, that's saying since, since no one in the history of the New York City policing will do a better job than Commissioner Kelly, can he share with us the neighborhood he lives in so I can <laughs> feel safe? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Lower Manhattan. Yes. Well, but, I, but I'm not advertising it. <laughs> that's as far <laughs> as I'm going. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Kelly, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us at Minwood FSU, my partners Chaim, Sandy, and Aaron, and Michal for spending an hour with us. It's really been informative and thoughtful and wonderful, and we really, really appreciate your time. Uh, I wish you much success in your endeavors uh, in the future, and we all pray for a New York City that returns to its glory. Uh, and unfortunately, we are pessimistic a little bit right now, near term, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. And with guidance from you, for whoever's the next mayor and the next commissioner, hopefully we'll get on, on a better track. I uh, just want to say thank you again. We really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was really an honor to be with you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Natasha, I think you have a closing announcement about recordings or something. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Matthew. If you wish to see the recording of the session, it's already on our Facebook page, we would have to see official. And if you are, it will be also on our YouTube page so you can watch it and share it with your friends. Thank you so much and see you at our next session. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Kelly again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy it. Have a good day.